in A Pluralistic Universe by William James. We are in Lecture 2. Now, James is about to go over an argument used by the Hegelians for their philosophy of the absolute. I think I'm going to try to summarize the argument and James' criticism of it, and then go to his words and see if perhaps we can... Um, deal with the matter more briefly than as my usual style. Also, I have class in 25 minutes, so I want to be sure to finish quickly, if at all possible. So, but let us first pass in review, says William James, the general style of argumentation of that philosophy. As I read it, its favorite way of meeting pluralism and empiricism is by a reductio ad absurdum framed somewhat as follows. So now I'm going to summarize the argument, then I'll phrase, uh, then I'll read his, his framing of it. So let's say... Um, uh, two, any two objects, and one has an effect on the other. Say, I'm moving my teacup, I'm moving the kettle. Let's say the kettle and the teacup. So the kettle has an effect on the teacup, right? We have the teacup and the kettle. One has an effect on the other. So the Hegelian philosopher, who's looking for uh, evidence of everything ultimately being one thing, evidence of a monistic pantheism, the Hegelian philosopher says, well, you have these two things, the kettle and the teacup, and one has an effect on the other. But how does it have an effect? There must be some influence that the kettle has on the teacups. Now we have three things. The kettle, the kettle's influence between the two, and then the teacup. And then so that third thing, the influence of the kettle, well, we now have to ask between the influence and the teacup, the invisible influence over here and the teacup, we have to ask, how does this thing connect to the teacup? So, how does this connect to the teacup? How does the kettle connect to the teacup? Through its influence. That influence is a third thing. So now, between the influence and the teacup, how does the influence connect to the teacup? Well, there must be some influence of the influence on the teacup. You need a, a fourth thing, and you can continue this argument on into infinity. And so, the Hegelian will argue, if you admit that two things are fundamentally different things, that the teacup and the tea kettle are different realities, you must admit that there's an infinite difference between everything, there's an infinite number of different things, and none of them are even connected by an argument such as this. Or, alternatively, if you at once admit that there is some real connection between uh, the teacup and the kettle, then you have to admit that fundamentally, ultimately, metaphysically speaking, they're really just one thing. So James is going to present this argument, and then he's going to say, well, it's a clever argument, it's a pretty argument, and it's ridiculous. It is a merely verbal argument. It's playing with words. It's not taking <laughs> reality seriously. James will describe what he calls uh, vicious intellectualism. Vicious intellectualism is a particular way of playing with names. Vicious intellectualism means you give something a name, and then you act like everything not included in the name is excluded from that thing. So I, I might call this a teacup, and that would mean that it doesn't have any other function. I'm not allowed to use it as a paperweight. I'm not allowed to use it as a coffee cup. I'm not allowed to use it as a water cup. Well, I would never use it as a coffee cup because I hate coffee. But the point is, metaphysically, if you're a vicious intellectualist, you would say that it's not even possible for it to be a coffee cup or paperweight because I named it teacup, and that excludes it having any other uh, any other aspect. Everything not included in the name of teacup is excluded from the item by its name. That's uh, a mistake in thinking that James says is vicious intellectualism. And that's basically what the Hegelians are doing in their argument. They will say that if once you admit uh, some connection between the teacup and the kettle, you must admit that everything is one. And if you say that there's any distinction, then the whole universe falls apart into an infinite number of distinct separate things that can never connect to one another. And James says, well, that's just playing with names. It's a sort of vicious intellectualism. It's saying, name them as if they are distinct, and then you're not allowed to say that there's any connection. Or, name them as connected, and then you're not allowed to say that there's any distinctness. That's the Hegelian style of argumentation, and it's silly. It's better to just admit that uh, the way the world presents it to itself, the way the world presents itself to us in experience, is probably the way it is. And in experience, we see teacup, tea kettle, not the same thing. And yeah, there's some connection. They are able to connect. They can uh, have some connection. One can indeed influence the other. Okay. I think I've explained the general idea. Now let's just go to the words, and I'll be able to perhaps go through them with minimal commentary. 
So the favorite way of arguing against pluralism and empiricism used by these Hegelians is uh, what I was describing of James' words. You contend, it, it being Hegelian pantheism, you contend, it says to the pluralist, that things, though in some respects connected, are in other respects independent, so that they are not members of the one all-inclusive individual fact. Well, your position is absurd on either point. For admit, in fact, the slightest modicum of independence, and you find, if you'll only think about it accurately, that you have to admit more and more of it, until at last nothing but an absolute chaos, or the proved impossibility of any connection whatever between the parts of the universe remains upon your hands. Admit, on the other hand, the most incipient minimum of relation between any two things, and again, you can't stop until you see the absolute, until you see that the absolute unity of all things is implied. So, uh, the Hegelian says to the pluralist, the Hegelian says to the empiricist, the Hegelian absolutist, pantheist, says to someone like William James, who thinks, uh, even if all is divine, all is not one. There are distinct realities. The Hegelian says to that person, well, you say there's two distinct things, teacup, tea kettle, and there's still some connection between them. One is able to influence the other, have an effect on the other, connect with the other, meet the other in, in the world. Well, if you admit one of those things, you cannot have the other. If you admit that there are two things, then the world divides itself logically into pure chaos. Um, this can't influence the other without some third thing, some influence between them, and then that influence won't be able to influence the teacup. The influence of the kettle won't be able to influence the teacup unless you cross it some way for the influence to influence the teacup, some third thing, some second influence between them and infinite regress, etc., etc., uh, infinite chaos, nothing makes sense. Or at any rate, there's no connection between anything. Everything's uh, indivis infinitely divisibly atomistic. All right. Uh, what's the alternative? The alternative is admit once that there is some connection between them, and dang if they don't have to be apparently the same thing, thing all in one. So uh, thus James presents the Hegelian argument, and um, James will illustrate with one particular Hegelian's analysis, Lotz, L-O-T-Z-E, uh, in his well-known proof of monism. Suppose Lotz says in effect, and for simplicity's sake I have to paraphrase him, says James, Many distinct beings, A, B, C, etc., to exist independently of each other, can A, in that case, ever act on B. What is it to act? Is it not to exert an influence? Does the influence detach itself from A and find B? If so, it is a third fact, and the problem is not how A acts, but how its influence acts on B. By another influence, perhaps? And in the end, how in the end does the chain of influences find B rather than C, unless B is somehow prefigured in them already? So, uh, again, division into an infinitely... <laughs> An infinitely continuing separation of different realities is what is necessary if you just once admit that any two things are distinct. So if they can connect, they can't be distinct. They have to just be one, says the Hegelian. Uh, eventually, uh, presenting the Hegelian view, borrowing from uh, the Hegelian Lotz, L-O-T-Z-E is, is the name of that particular Hegelian, borrowing from Lotz, the Hegelian view on two distinct things has to be, they would form two universes, each living by itself, making no difference to each other. They must therefore belong together beforehand, be co-implicated already. Their natures must have an inborn mutual reference, each, uh, each to each. The Hegelian says, uh, if two things have any connection to each other, they must ultimately be one thing. There's no way to explain their having uh, existence even in the same universe and having any connection to each other unless all is ultimately one. Uh, skipping a bit, James says, a pretty argument, but a purely verbal one, as I apprehend it. Call your A and B distinct. They can't interact. Call them one. They can. If you call them distinct, then you say they can't interact. If you call them one, then you say they can interact. That's the Hegelian approach. And James says, that's just a verbal argument. We're done. not even dealing with reality. We're just playing with names. Uh, Lotz's remedy for the impossibility that's verbally found is to change the first word. If instead of calling A and B independent, we now call them interdependent, united, or one, he says, these words do not contradict any sort of mutual influence that may be proposed, um, uh, etc., etc. To construe any one of their abstract names as making their total nature impossible is a misuse of the function of naming. Okay, so James is now speaking for himself, not, not trying to represent the Hegelians to construe any one of their abstract names as making their total nature impossible is a misuse of the function of namings. The treating of a name as excluding from the fact named what the name's definition fails positively to include is what I call vicious intellectualism. It's vicious intellectualism to give a thing a name and then say that that thing 
can't have any characteristic not included in the name. Well, I might name this thing a teacup. That doesn't mean it can't be a coffee cup or a paperweight. I might name this thing a book. That can't mean it's nothing else. It might also be a fan. Not a great fan, but one could use it as a fan. It might all... That, that's not so bad. You could use it as a fan. You could use it as a paperweight for some other papers. You could use it as a weapon if you throw it at your enemies. I don't know. It's not the best weapon. Um, a thing being named does not preclude that it has no characteristic other than what's captured by the name. It's silly to say otherwise. So if you name the teacup and the tea kettle one, that doesn't mean there's no distinctness. If you name them connected, rather, that doesn't mean there's no distinctness. If you name them distinct, that doesn't mean there can't be any connection. Come on, that's silly. So now, how does the world appear to us? If we are empiricists and go from parts to wholes, we believe that beings first may exist and feed, so to speak, on their own existence, and then secondarily become known to one another. If we are empiricists, we may admit that things first begin individually, and then they may uh, build on that into some sort of combined unity. But philosophers of the absolute tell us that such independence of being from being known would, if once admitted, disintegrate the universe beyond all hope of mending. Now, uh, let's see. If we are empiricists and go from parts to wholes, we believe that beings may first exist and then secondarily become, one, become known to one another. So we begin with two distinct beings, and then we move on towards them knowing each other. The Hegelian will not recognize any distinction between being and knowing, which is part of why uh, the Hegelian philosophy tends towards pantheism. All being must be knowing and known, and you can't have any separation between the two, and so all must be mind and therefore divine. This is an absurdly oversimplified presentation of one aspect of Hegelian thought, but it's, well... Keep it in mind that it is perhaps oversimplified. Uh, it is there. This sort of thing is an aspect of Hegelian thought. Philosophers of the Absolute tell us that such independence of being from being known would, if once admitted, disintegrate the universe beyond all hope of mending. We once say that there's one thing that is and another thing that is independently of their knowing each other, independently of them having some influence on each other, independently me and the teacup, independently of me knowing the teacup, then... Uh, if we once admit, according to the Hegelian, if we once admit that there's any independence of the teacup and me as separate beings, distinct beings, before I know the teacup, or the teacup is known by me, then the whole universe disintegrates into completely disconnected parts. So I, I said a moment ago, um, now James is speaking for himself, and then I went back to him representing... Uh, the Hegelian view. Sorry, I'm, even before I said that, he'd already uh, spoken for himself and then gone back to representing the Hegelian view, so I hope this isn't confusing. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we can wrap up this video. Skipping a few paragraphs. The purely verbal character of the operation is undisguised. Here's James criticizing Hegelianism, speaking totally for himself. Uh, if you want to find the text, by the way, and you're looking at a public domain edition of the text online, this is the paragraph beginning with, The reasoning is pleasing from its ingenuity. The Hegelian reasoning is clever. It's new. It's brilliant. It's original. The reasoning is pleasing from its ingenuity. And it is almost a pity that so straight a bridge from abstract logic to concrete fact should not bear our weight. Uh, it's a beautiful criticism James is making of the Hegelians. All right. Um, to have the alternative forced upon us of admitting either finite things, each cut off from all relation with its environment, or else of accepting the integral absolute with no environment and all relations packed within itself would be too delicious a simplification. Um, he's exposing the false dichotomy fallacy that Hegelians are working with. It. Either these two things are connected or they are distinct, but you can't have it both ways. In fact, you can have it both ways. But the purely verbal character of the operation is undisguised. The argument is just playing with words, he says. Because the names of finite things and their relations are disjoined, the names of finite things and their relations are disjoined, it doesn't follow that the realities named need a deus ex machina from on high to join them. Just because we have um, recognized a distinction between the teacup and the kettle as distinct objects, and then 
their connection. Just because we've acknowledged that there's a distinction between, on the one hand, these distinct objects and they're having some influence on each other, they're meeting in the world. Just because we recognize that distinction, it does not follow that they need some miracle from on high to join them. The same things disjoined in one respect appear as conjoined in another. The same things that appear to be not the same things, that appear to be distinct, also appear to be connected in experience. Naming the disjunction doesn't debar us from also naming the conjunction in a later modifying statement for the two are absolutely coordinate elements in the finite tissue of experience. Now I think I may risk summarizing a whole lot of William James just by saying it's really quite simple. After all this logic and this representation, all this representing of the clever Hegelian arguments and this um, eloquent but subtle critique of the Hegelian arguments, we can say the facts are very simple. James is telling us some very simple facts. The fact is a teacup and a tea kettle, in our experience, appear as distinct things that have some connection. They are distinct things and they can meet in the real world and one can have some influence on the other. And that, uh, these two facts of experience are all we need to know that it's perfectly reasonable, and indeed more reasonable, to say that reality is pluralistic. Uh, perfectly reasonable to say reality is pluralistic, and indeed more reasonable than to say that it is monistic. More from a pluralistic universe by William James next time. Thanks for watching.